Hello, hello, everybody. Hello. hello. <laughs> oh, we're live. It's working. Nice. <laughs> I think. Oh, man. <laughs> Let me try Twitter again. Yeah, we're we not do this live every on time. Twitter. <laughs> every single time. Okay, Doo -doo. Technology. Oh, it's working. Oh, but I have to mute this tab. Okay. Great. All right. Cool. Welcome back to 321, the series from Maker's Place, where we uh, ask a guest to bring on three pieces from Maker's Place to talk about two pieces from a different on-chain marketplace to talk about and um, and one piece that is not on chain uh, today we have sorry I'm just gonna make sure that I have my my browser set to do not disturb Great. Also, we're not on Twitter Brady yet I don't see Twitter live at least from my um, it looks it says it's live. It says we're broadcasting. Okay, let's hope so. <laughs> Here, I get the. I have the link. Um, what if I just? Can I just tweet it out or from Maker's yeah, yeah, Place? Yeah. yeah, sure. It's our fourth episode, Cat. Right. So the first one, I was the guest. Brady was the host, the second one was the other way around, and then we had Adam and now it's you. And awesome. I think it's gonna take us like a few more episodes to <laughs> see how this technology works. Because it also it, like we it Twitter gets a lot of updates as well. Yeah. And it didn't have video before and now we can stream. It's always like something new. So it's it's the first 10 minutes of these shows are great. I love that. They're like very much behind the scenes. I love that. <laughs> and then we dive into art <laughs> right after. Well, I, uh, I will be the first to admit I am just not very technologically savvy, like at all. Um, we have like, like a smart house system and I couldn't even tell you how to run it. So, um, not knowing, you know, Twitter updates and, you know, connections and all that is, is completely on par with, with me as well. So. <laughs> it's funny. I thought I was super tech savvy till I joined NFTs and I'm like, okay, I don't know anything. <laughs> <laughs> I never thought I was tech savvy. Um, <laughs> Kat, why don't you introduce yourself? Tell us a little bit about what you do, not only at Maker's Place, but kind of where, where were you before Maker's Place? Um, what's your experience in the art world? Those kinds of things. Definitely. Well, first of all, thank you so much for inviting me to do this and helping me get out of my comfort zone. Um, I absolutely adore the two of y'all and I'm so lucky to work with you. So um, this will be fun. Um, so I'm Kat and I have been with Maker's Place um, this fall, it will be three years actually. Um, I joined back when the team was about 17 people and um, it was a very new and exciting time. I feel like it still is. Um, but I have a background firmly rooted in traditional art. I studied art history, um, went to Sotheby's for my master's and really worked, um, you know, the, the first decade or so of my career in the traditional art world. Um, and then this opportunity to um, join Maker's Place opened up and I literally jumped at it. Um, and uh, I was about, let's see, I was about four months postpartum with my, my son. 
And uh, my husband was like, you sure you want to leave Sotheby's? Like, it's, it's, you know, it's what you know, it's what you're familiar with. And uh, he was like, maybe we've had enough changes for one year. But no, um, this was where I was meant to be. And I'm, I'm just absolutely thrilled to be working in this space with incredible artists um, and really, really um, interesting and dynamic collectors. So um, at Maker's Place, I, speaking of collectors, um, I manage uh, client relations and um, I started a program called the Concierge Program, um, which, you know, I really just help collectors find and acquire art that they love and can't live without. So um, it's a really, it's a really big joy for me in my life to get to not only look at art, but talk about it a lot during the day. And uh, so that's me. Um, I'm also a wife and a mama. Um, I have a son, Thomas, who will be three in May. Um, and when I'm not working at Maker's Place, I am just enjoying outdoors and being with my fam, so. Amazing. Well, let's jump right into it with your first selection. All righty. Again, we start with three pieces from Maker's Place. We move on to two pieces from other marketplaces and then end with one piece that is not on chain. This particular piece that you picked will never be on chain. <laughs> no, it will not. <laughs> I mean, maybe, you know, maybe in, in 10 years when, if everything goes on chain. Maybe yeah, but, yeah. Maybe, maybe um, museums will go that direction. Yeah. Uh, I love this piece. This piece was actually my desktop uh, background for a little bit right when uh, Gina minted it. So why don't you talk us through this? And why you picked it? Yeah, well, um, first of all, uh, this piece um, was a piece where the artist was new to me. Um, and the piece itself is what grabbed me. So I immediately appreciated the colors but then as you zoom in and look at the details it's almost like texturized um and then when i went to read up on the artist um it was incredible to to learn so much more about the academics that um go into her works um so i think that there's just so much um, in the description of the piece, but also in the artist's story. And um, that to me was really engaging and something that, that grabbed me. Um, it's also a work um, by an artist who um, was curated for a show that we did in Miami. Um, and she was curated by two other incredible women who I admire and um, very much respect um, with Accelerate Art. So I, um, you know, it was kind of like the full package for me. So first the art really grabbed me, um, then getting to know a bit more about the artist um, and her process just kind of made it full circle um, for me. And, and I just, I adore this piece. It's, um, it's actually a digital that comes with a physical twin, um, which is super special. Um, I think there's a lot of collectors out there who are interested in the conversation between digital and physical, um, and maybe they'd prefer to hang a painting in their home at this time, but they also have the optionality to someday also hang a screen and display the digital version um as well or instead of so yeah and the one remarkable thing that needs to be said about this piece is that it is a painting that it is not you know this is not a generative work um though it you know you see it on a screen uh we're so used to being on screens in this in this space you see this kind of passing on twitter it definitely you just think oh it's a generative piece there's probably 99 others of these but now this is a hand painted piece and quite large if i remember i I, yeah. I never saw it in person yeah it's it's a very big painting it's 
uh, I'd never forget the moment that I got into Sagamore Hotel and saw the painting in real life and I was like wow I was not expecting this painting to be this big and it's so beautiful obviously I love that like on screen as well and as Brady just mentioned every day we just scroll down on Twitter see a lot of beautiful pieces but then when you see some of them in real life and they're like physical paintings it has it has a different feeling I yeah. I love digital work as well I love generative work like usually things that also come with data or even AI but still I feel like physical work has a different soul and the colors like the textures the details it's just mesmerizing I love it such yeah. a great choice <laughs> <laughs> yeah I think um I, I wish I could have been there in Miami to see not only this piece but also your piece um you know, I think there's, you know, when you experience monumental artwork in person, there's this awe moment where you're, you know, you're just struck by, you know, the scale of it. And that is oftentimes lost when we view things on the screen. So um, I, I just think it's really incredible that this um, exists and by the way, it's available for a very lucky collector to acquire. Um, and yeah, it's just, it's a beautiful work of art by an incredible artist. And um, another couple of things that I, I want to say about this is I did interview Gina for this show and I would encourage everybody to track that down. I don't have the link handy, but if you go to rare.makersplace.com, which is our blog, you could search for it. Um, it's a really great, uh, very brief interview. I think we went through five or six questions. Um, and you get a little more of a window into her process. She's got a very uh, spiritual component to her practice. The other thing is that this painting um, is not just a physical. It is in, it, when, uh, it's installed with a Transient Labs trace chip. So it's actually directly correlated or connected to the NFT. Yeah. Yeah. I think there's incredible tech that um, is being utilized to bridge the two worlds of traditional physical art and digital art. And that's a perfect example of, you know, what transients developed um, there. They just, I feel like every week they come out with something new and um, incredibly interesting. And so, yeah, they're killing it. <laughs> cool. Let's before, go to the next piece. Oh, very quickly before we go to the next piece, I just uh, posted a comment with the interview that you did with her under our live show. Oh, so cool. For the people that are watching us, you can just read the interview after on the on our Maker's Place account. Amazing. Thank you for doing that. <laughs> So here we have Alamo NYC <laughs> vibes. So this piece, it like it epitomizes happiness for me. Um, I lived in New York City for about ten years, and going to the park with your friends and having a picnic, or I remember one time watching a World Cup match in the park on like a massive jumbo screen. Um, you know, that's just such a part of the New York City experience. Um, and so this has a lot of nostalgia for me. Um, but I also just really appreciate the the 2D um, depiction of the scene. Uh, I think a lot of times we tend to um, you know, photography is, is so prevalent and there's so many details in that. But, you know, if you zoom out and you just look at something and in terms of blocks of color or blocks of, you know, shapes, um, you still get the complete picture and the message comes through. Um, so for me, this piece is beautiful, happy, and reminds me of sunny days in the parks. I love these two choices because both of them 
are physical pieces and they somehow look digital and a very clean digital piece so this one again i had the same feeling first time when i ever um saw all alimo's uh, work a few years ago i was like oh wow this person is great at illustrator you know like the um, the software because it looks exactly like how clean illustrator can gives you all sort of can give you all sort of like clean lines and paintings and then i just again saw alimo's pieces in person and some of his behind the scenes and I think it took me a while to to believe that they're all handmade by acrylics. And they look so good in person again. And also obviously on the screen. But the feeling that they have is just it's like a dream world very clean that you can somehow find, as you said, like at, at the park and all that. But when I look at this, then I want to go to the park and I look at the park <laughs> differently this time. <laughs> it's just so, so like the vibe of vacations usually and then clean nature, no human uh, destruction. I just love how positive they are and the colors and all that. Huge fan of Andrew Alamo. Yeah. Um, it's actually funny that I chose to, unintentionally two works that are are physical um and you know i think that just speaks to the versatility of artists in this space um that it, there's so much incredible skill and um and just just skill <laughs> that uh, i have like zero creative artistic skills in my body literally none uh i could draw a stick figure um but so i think what i am drawn to is art that like inspires me and i'm like wow i can't believe the artist you know did this in order to create this and um so this piece is very much in that vein for me as well Yeah, and I, I do love the, it's the lack of detail that allows you to kind of project yourself onto this. I, I lived in New York for 12 years and yeah, the park was just like, that was what you, that's what you do when it's nice outside because nobody has a yard. And, um, and if you live in New York, you love to people watch and uh, you got to meet up with friends somehow. And yeah, I love that the buildings in the background really kind of, uh, it's, it, there's no detail, obviously. It's just like these, these, it doesn't even look like a real building in the way. I mean, not that any of this looks real, but the bench looks more real than the building does look real. Um, but it gives this hint of like, uh, being in, enclosed a bit still. Um, yeah yeah it's a beautiful piece yeah all right the next piece we've actually uh <laughs> he was one of my selections not this piece in particular but was one of my selections for uh, my episode so let's get into it you know i have yet to speak with anyone who isn't a huge fan of this artist work um this artist has to be the most universally loved and admired artist out there. Um, I actually was uh, just in, in Dubai for the Art Dubai Digital and had like three different conversations with people about this artist. So <laughs> um, it has truly gone global. Um, but this piece, uh, The Algebra of Love, um, this is actually a piece that I placed with a private collector a few years ago. Um, and I, I've always been really intrigued by the sublime, um, and art that references the sublime. Um, you know, I think there's this dangerous uncertainty about a lot of, of art that deals with subliminal messaging um, and the, the unknown. Um, and this piece, while absolutely, in my opinion, beautiful, um, it's it's got like a, a quietness to it. There's also this 
uncomfortableness uh, to it as well. Um, this dense fog that totally abstracts the user or the viewer's um, view of, of what is out there. Um, and then this mystical figure um, with, you know, allegorical elements, um, tree limbs that, that look like wings, apples that are falling from the tree. I just, there's so many um, messages within this and, and anyone can interpret art the way they'd like to. Um, but for me, this piece has so many elements and qualities to it that just capture me and, and make me want to study it and, and learn more. Um, so for me, I was I was thrilled when I was able to place this piece and the collector I know also loves it. Um, but the rest of Hussein's body of work is no less incredible. Um, I think every piece has a strength to it that is um, undeniable and incredibly unique. So um, if, if anybody is watching this, and I kind of hope nobody is because I'm very shy, um, but if anyone is watching this and is not familiar with this artist, I, I just implore you to go and, and discover more. Yeah, I, I love this piece. I, like you said, there's so many things that you could read into it. I mean, the first thing that I think of is Magritte, Son of Man um with the the guy with the apple in front of his face <clears throat> mm -hmm. but then there's also this interesting like uh devil angel kind of thing and it's like which apple is the devil and which is the angel because there's a green one and a red one it's also interesting that it looks like he'll never reach that apple yeah um and it's it would end up being like if he really tried it would be like a dog chasing its tail kind of situation yeah and i do really love the claustrophobia that that the, the fog creates where it's like this is the only person on earth so something i love about hossein is the the recurring use of this suit and the hat which recalls samuel beckett to me or um another uh there's just like there are these these absurdist kind of novelists and and playwrights that that hossein's work reminds me of like rudy woolitzer is another one Leonard Cohen's novels actually um, mm -hmm. kind of recall this like isolated individual kind of fighting this absurd uh, or, or struggling with this kind of absurd situation or existence that they were just kind of plopped into. Yeah, yeah, spot on. Yeah, it's interesting that Brady and I, we both saw Rene Magritte, but I saw other pieces of Rene Magritte, which are actually from um, the same person, I think with the same hat, but from behind. Uh, the Intimate Friend, if I'm not wrong, and the other one, I think it was called the Ready Made Bouquet or something similar to that. Those two are, um, like, I, I just saw this very also similar, obviously not, <laughs> similar but at the same time like it reminds me of those as well that it's a whole story in front of that person that we don't know what's going on like when i look at those uh paintings from Rene Magritte, i was like i really wanted to see the face to see like how he felt or like how, what is happening in front of him that we can't really see and i get the same feeling from this one and what i love about hussein's work is the storytelling he always has lots of storytelling in all the frames that he creates. And also the fact that, again, these are not AI, nothing yeah. against AI, but this person travels. <laughs> he sets up the whole, let's say, place, the composition and everything. Everything is just so well made. And they're, mm -hmm. they're just hand handmade. <laughs> And it is not the right word for that. Definitely not my English. Sorry, but <laughs> it's like no. something that he creates the scenes and I have so much respect for that. And also coming from Iran, I know it's not an easy thing. I know he has been through a lot sometimes while creating his photos, but he still does that and he still like never allows anything to stop his creativity. So I have mad respect for him. And this piece actually I had never seen that before. 
So thank you so much for choosing it. It's so good. Yeah, I um, I agree with everything y'all have, have said. Um, and I I also see the Magritte, you know, references. Um, and I I love you can just tell that he's put thought into every aspect of the the image that he's taking, and it's been incredibly planned out. Um, and for me, I think. Um, you know, it's it's just a beautiful work of art. But um, the, you know, I, I always enjoy seeing when he posts, you know, behind the scenes or like, you know, information about his process, how he built something, um, a composition or an idea that led to something. Um, because, you know, it's just, it's absolutely brilliant, so. Let's move on to two pieces from elsewhere. This piece is remarkable. Yes. Um, so I chose Tara Donovan. Um, I think Tara Donovan is an incredible traditional artist. Um, she works in large scale, large scale sculpture and installations. Um, she's um, uh, represented by Pace Gallery in New York. So she has a huge um, portfolio um, of incredible, incredible sculpture work, digital, or sorry, not digital, um, physical works. Um, but then um, when my incredible friend, Ariel Hudes um, at Pace uh, started working on Pace Verso, um, and started, you know, alongside Art Blocks, um, launching these wonderful generative projects. Uh, this collection was was truly an interesting one. Um, it's every piece is just simply made up of a single letter from the alphabet, um, and. Uh, Tara's work always looks at, you know, just everyday objects or everyday concepts and then elevating them. Um, and this collection to me was was very much a, a continuation of that um, of that vein of that artistic practice. So, um, you know, I love the entire collection. Um, I think this is the W letter. Um, but you know, these works, when you see them in person, and I had a chance to go see them um, at the gallery as well, um, you know, it's, you almost don't even realize until you study up close, um, you know, what is actually creating the work of art. Um, so I kind of like that, that ambiguity, but then the very um, uh, deliberate usage um, of, of the alphabet. So for me, it's just um, a really fantastic generative series by an artist that I hugely admire. Um, and uh, so that's my first choice. Can I go? <laughs> yeah, you go. We're going to trade off. <laughs> Absolutely stunning piece. I love generative art and I did not know much about it obviously before NFT space and it's been only a few years that I'm like learning more about it and I tried it a few times. I tried coding it did not end well at all. So I have so much respect for generative artists as well and then this one is so just cool to even watch and I feel like if it's on a huge screen I would love to just like go and then like be hypnotized by that it's so <laughs> it has that hip hypnotic I don't know how you call that like that aspect as well and then uh, you just mentioned it's the letter W right I think that's this one um, I'm pretty sure it is, yeah. Cool. yeah I would love to know how she 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 made it. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I know. It's incredible. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and and it's quite simplistic too. I mean, it's just black and white, right? Um, and a single letter. So, you know, really elevating the most simple concepts and colors to something incredibly capturing. Yeah, I love how it kind of feels like it's breathing a little bit. If you just stare at it, the little the black part 
starts to kind of pulse um, yeah. <laughs> in a weird way. And um, yeah, I love this. I mean, my one of my first art crushes was Saul LeWitt. Um, and that was where I sort of discovered generative art in a, in a very old school, non-computer based way, but just, you know, setting a rule for oneself and then executing. Um, so it's been interesting for me to get into the NFT space and see all these great generative artists. And I, do, I especially love it. And this is something, cause I'm also a big nerd for text-based art and mm -hmm. And there's a kind of overlap, which is, which is, you can, is evident here, um, which is, you know, using the kind of everyday um, object of, of a letter or a word and, and just deciding that you're going to manipulate it in a certain way and yeah. using that as like the generative, as the basis for a generative piece. But I think there's a lot of overlap between text artists and and um, generative artists, and this is this is just a great example of it. Agreed. I um, I in a previous role, uh, previous company had the great honor and fortune of cataloging um, a majority of the Ankara estate, um, and his artworks are um, like you see it and you know it's On's work. Um, and so for me, I spent a bulk of a year actually cataloging um, what felt like millions of black and white date paintings um, with a few blue ones scattered in there. Um, but um, interestingly enough, Robert Alice's uh, book that he just published with Tashin, um, the uh, you know, the lead into the chapter on generative art includes an incredible essay. Um, I think it's Raya Myers wrote it, um, but references to Ankuara's work, Solowitz's work, um, and how it's it's just a progression of of these incredible artists um, and seeing, you know, the art that's produced today that's that's in that same. Um, direction. So um, I feel like I'm going down an art history rabbit hole and getting way too academic here, but um, it's it's definitely something I, I love to talk about. So. Yeah, you know, I actually, I published an essay on Maker's Place a couple months ago about data art, data-based art, um, and Ankawara's date paintings were the first thing that I referenced. Um, which is, it's just interesting, you can consider it data art or generative art. There's definitely overlap there. Um, Brendan Dawes is, is in the essay and he, I would consider him more of a data artist than a generative artist. He's often called a generative artist, but I'm curious when you were working on this, did you get to see any exhibitions of like, oh, I've, I've, I've never gotten to be in a room with a bunch of date paintings, but I have a feeling that it's very humbling and and makes one feel both small and big at the same time. <laughs> yes. Um, you know, I think a lot of people would be surprised by the scale of on state paintings. I mean, they're not, they're not huge. Um, I think I've seen an exhibition where they were hung in a, an enormous space. Um, so you have, obviously four walls and a lot of negative space in the middle, right? Because it's huge and you can only have the four walls and the works were hung um, chronologically just at, you know, at the average eye height. I'm a little short, so, <laughs> um, it, you know, probably what, like five, five and a half feet, they were hung on the wall and it was just very um, uh, moving, very, um, just a, a really wonderful presentation of, of the works. Um, and it is interesting when all of a sudden like a blue work appears in the sequence of the dates um, or a red one appears. Um, so I think, um, you know, it's, it's incredible anytime you get to experience art, but there's certain exhibitions that stick with you. <laughs> Totally. I think I think I saw pictures of that that exhibition when I was trying to figure out what which p which photo I was going to use to represent the the series. Mm -hmm. 
Let's move on to the next piece, shall we? Another piece of generative art it appears <laughs> to be. I know. I'm, I'm realizing now I have I have uh, buckets that I seem to like. Um, I do. I have a type. Like um, clean art. That's what I would love to say. <laughs> Everything is like very clean and tidy. I love that. <laughs> You're the same in that. I, I might be a little type A. <laughs> um, actually, I picked this piece, much like Alamo's piece. Um, uh, I am Southern. Um, my heritage is Southern. And quilting is something that's been in my family for generations. And um, anyone who is Southern understands that um, quilts have both a, you know, real purpose, um, but they also are incredible ways of telling a story or um, a family's history. Um, my mom actually made me a quilt for my wedding present when I got married. Um, and it's one of my most prized possessions. So for me, quilts are incredibly important um, and are historical references. Um, the Guise Bend quilters are just absolutely famous in the South. Um, and they hold a reservoir of history and skill set and just the the act of passing down narrative and skills. Um, so when I saw this um, generative collection, um, I was just completely taken by it. Um, the colors are beautiful. I love the way that the technology has um, integrated with the historical um, physical work itself. And I actually had the good fortune to um, see a physical quilt next to a digital one at a collector's home. Um, and it was it was just beautiful. Um, so this is this is an, another piece that is moving and and one that I uh, I really just appreciate. That's fascinating. I wasn't, I, I definitely didn't catch the, the background with the, the quilters upon looking at it, even though the name says G's Ben Quilters, <laughs> clearly. And I made this deck based on your choices. Um, but what struck me about it is uh, you, you talked about the, the tidiness of it, but it's kind of a tidy mess. It's like a like a pixelated abstract expressionist piece um and i just i love the colors i love the the shapes it's one of these interesting pieces that definitely i just i just want to stare at but um i don't necessarily have any deep or profound thoughts about um i just i love the recurring the the green that kind of runs through it. I, th I think that's like the thing that really ties it together. Even when you get to that top middle messy part, um, it's the green that's really kind of keeping it all together. <clears throat> and uh, yeah, I mean, I don't have anything, anything brilliant to add. Um, <laughs> it's just a lovely, it's a lovely piece. And I, I thank you for sharing. Of course. It's interesting that I just learned a new word called quilt because I never heard that before. But we have that in Iran as well since like many, many, many years ago. Oh, yeah. And it's, it's been kept by generations. And actually, I had this blanket with almost the same colors that we call. We don't call them quilts in Iran. It's called 40 pieces. So it's not necessarily 40 squares, but can be like hundred different squares that each one of them they have like different textures and colors and it's like similar to I think quilts here. And it reminded me of that right after I saw that and when you said what it meant, I was like, oh my God, that's great. It, it actually brought my childhood back, but in also another way, Atari was what I was always playing with as a kid. And there was this game called River Raid. I don't know if you, any of you have ever played that. That was a, an airplane. That was just like going up it was like pixelated and the colors were darker than this but the setting was exactly like these two lines not in the center but like right and left part was how you should have not 
um, touch them because that was game over. Like this plane had to just go up, <laughs> fill the tank with the gas and just like go up. And then when I saw it, I was like, oh my God, that's that game, but way happier. Cause I remember the stress that I experienced as a kid, not <laughs> like facing the game over sign <laughs> all my childhood. And I was like, I wish the colors were this beautiful <laughs> in that one. But it reminded me of that and like the 8-bit uh, music as well. I, I really like the piece. And again, everything that you chose is very like graphic design at the same time painting. They're very clean and I love, love all the choices. Oh, thanks. I, you know, I'm sure um, quilting and and the act of passing on stories and history um, I'm sure it's shared by so many cultures around the world. And I love hearing that, you know, you had this revelation like, oh yes, we have that too. Like, I love that. Um, it's a global, um, kind of brings us all together. Um, also, funny enough, as I just stare at this piece um, in the lower right of the center quadrant, there's almost like a little space invader. Do y'all see that? The little green, like, Yes. <laughs> love it. Yeah, I love that. <laughs> I was just talking with my mic off. But yes, I see it. <laughs> I see it too. <laughs> I, I'm running my cursor over it, but you can't see it. I that's this is a, a I don't know if that's a feature or a bug. Um <laughs> but to uh, destroy Parin's theory about your taste. We're going to move on to this last piece. Yeah. Which looks like... It has like been changed now. <laughs> proto Abex um, galore. Well, this piece um, for me um, is a seminal work in art history. Um, I wrote my senior year thesis on this work. Um, it's Nocturne in Black and Gold, often called The Falling Rocket by James Abbott McNeil Whistler. Who knew people had four names? Um, <laughs> uh, but this piece um, is beautifully um, composed. Um, but also holds an incredibly important place in history, given the drama around it. Um, it's a piece that the artist painted um, at night. Um, he painted what he felt was a representation of what he experienced, which was these beautiful fireworks in the night sky. Um, and when this painting was uh, presented, a very famous art critic at the time um, decided, John Ruskin, uh, decided to say that this was not art and that this is, you know, should never be considered art, shouldn't be in the Royal Academy. Um, and uh, Whistler actually sued Ruskin um, in court and, and won. Um, and the premise of the court case was that art is whatever the artist says it is, okay? Like I'm the artist and I've created this work. And I, you know, as, as the person who's created it, I get to say that this is, this is my art, this is art. Um, and so for me, that's an incredibly important message in the history of art. Um, and also just really, really laid the basis for a lot of artists who have come after um, to say, it, it doesn't have to look exactly like what it is. You know, it doesn't have to be photographic and, and um, an exact representation. Um, we can abstract things, we can um, invoke feelings and, um, you know, it, it just doesn't have to be precious and perfect. So um, <laughs> all the other works may have been a little bit more, um, you know, uh, organized but this work is is not and the meaning behind it is something that's very important i have uh, a john ruskin quote about this painting 
oh. ready to go. Um, <laughs> I have seen and heard much of Cockney impudence before, but never expected to hear a coxcomb ask 200 guineas for flinging a pot of paint in the public's face. And um, when Whistler, I'm just reading this off of uh, dia.org, when Whistler won the libel suit, uh, he was awarded token damages of one farthing. What is a farthing worth? <laughs> I don't know. A penny? That's what it sounds yeah. like. I have no idea what <laughs> oh a farthing is worth. Doesn't sound like much, but he lives on in history, so. <laughs> I love learning about it. I did not know any story behind the piece. I just love the colors first, and then it's a very beautiful chaos. It's an organized mm -hmm. chaos. It's still organized, I have to say. It's not like very disorganized, just that I can see you kept the, the, the style. It's not like very different, but yeah, it's different from obviously the, the past five ones, but um, I'm definitely gonna read more about it because yeah, I, yeah, it's, it's all new for me. <laughs> it's amazing. Yeah. I, um, you know, I think like beautiful chaos is, is a, a great way of kind of explaining it. Um, this piece is for anyone in Detroit or like plans to go to Detroit. Um, it's in the Detroit Museum of Arts. Um, and, uh, it's, uh, I've never been myself. It's on my my list, but uh, it's hope to see it someday in person. Yeah, it's absolutely beautiful. And what I really like about it is the kind of balance between the, the mystery of what's going on and, and knowing what's going on. Like there's obviously fireworks um, happening. But then there's the, and there's this kind of vague figure on a shore um, looking out and the fireworks are going off in the water. But then there's that patch kind of just over the figure and off to the left that is like, you just can't, I can't really tell what that is. And it, it mimics, you know, exactly what you were saying with Whistler trying to portray his experience, this experience of looking out um, at night and having a, you know, you know what's going on, you're oriented, but you, you, you definitely can't pick out all the details, nor do you know necessarily what's happening. And because it's across the water, it's obviously even um, more obscured by, by the distance. But mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's a beautiful, beautiful piece. And you can kind of appreciate it from like this very abstract, position and then you can kind of switch modes to appreciating it from a very like literal um perspective yeah and you know i think um you know we're viewing this piece in 2024 with you know a full acceptance of abstract art but really this piece when it was created um 1875 Art was very precious. It was portraiture, it was beautiful scenes, beautiful colors, everything was in the right place. And this piece was new and bold and different. And so we're seeing it through through our lens and our experiences, but when this was created, it really was um, a, an upheaval of what art could be. Um, and, and this piece truly changed the trajectory of, of art from there on. So it's, uh, it's one of my faves. <laughs> yeah. You know, I think about that a lot, especially these days with so much going on with NFTs and AI and what's art, what's not art. I, I am a, a, his, a music history nerd and it's interesting to find out like, you know, in the 1800s or in the 1900s, like for instance, Stravinsky's Rite of Spring released in 1913, I guess it still sounds sort of dissonant to our ears now, but not nearly, I mean, it started a riot. Can you imagine uh, a riot at like, I mean, 
was just like what when Metallica had to cancel the concert in Montreal that one time and there were riots but it was it was just so upsetting to people how dissonant it was and it's just so interesting and you hear these you know we see a lot of uh contentious back and forth on on Twitter and in the news especially around the time of the 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 big first NFT bull run about just people getting really up in arms about what is art and what's not art. And I feel like when you get to that point and, and you have a an eye on history, you can feel pretty well assured that the thing that people are saying is not art is going to be a duh, of course it's art in in just a matter of time. Yeah, yeah. The canon is, is being written and uh, it's an honor to, you know, just be working in this moment in the art world, I think, um, in, the, in the history of art. And, you know, I think working alongside artists like Harine, for instance, who are absolutely um, just incredibly talented, um, there's never been a world in which you get to interact so closely with the artist. And um, it's, it's really incredible how many barriers have been broken down and the dialogue that's been able to be increased and elevated because of that. Um, so, you know, I just, I can't wait to see where we go from here. <laughs> I was just thinking about this, that how freely we are creating art these days and how freely we can just show this art to the world. I was just thinking about Whistler's paintings, like the portraits, and I'm pretty sure each one of them, they have a whole history, story sorry, behind it. And it's sometimes easy to find those stories online, but I wish I had the chance that I do have right now with the other artists, with them as well, to see like how they even came up with let's say this painting from the portrait like from years of creating portraits like how because this is for like so many years ago abstract again was not there the, the firsts are always interesting to know like how they came up with that idea and how much courage they had to do that for us now yeah. it's like i don't say we don't need that courage but it's like different it's much easier mm -hmm. you can do anything basically now yeah yeah um it's interesting because his portraits are also um, like his later portraits uh, can also be or at the time they were created were, were also a little um, uh, discussed or criticized because of, you know, the angles of the compositions or, or how he decided to present the figures. Um, and one of my favorite is Portrait of the Artist's Mother, uh, which is the piece that, that a lot of money and and a lot of money must have loved it as well because he did, you know, a fantastic digital artwork um, a few years ago, utilizing um, Whistler's, you know, portrait of the artist's mother. So um, there's so many connections and and veins that run congruently through, um, you know, from even from the 1800s. So. Yeah, I love. A lot of money's use of um, art history in his work. Uh, oh, that's the wrong direction. <laughs> well, Kat, we have come to the end. Thank you I so survived. much for joining <laughs> us, bringing these wonderful pieces. Um, I think three of the artists were completely new, or two of the artists were completely new to me, and this Whistler painting was also new to me. So thank you very much. It's been uh, an absolute pleasure. Yeah, me too. Thank you, guys. I uh, I really loved this. Thank you for having me. Yeah, thanks for accepting our invite. And thanks for being an incredible colleague as well. It's always so fun to work with you. And I learned a lot today, a lot today. As Brady said, four of the pieces were actually new for me. I knew Whistler through art history, but never saw this body of his work ever. So I'm going to have like a whole homework today after work, just read about it. And also the other previous artists. Thank you so much. Yeah, of course. I nominate our next team offsite for Detroit and we can all go visit this piece. Great. I love that. <laughs> Sounds good. <laughs>
Well, we're signing off. Thank you, everybody who has joined us today. Yeah, thank you so much. This is thank so you. fun. <laughs> See you in NFT NYC if you guys are going to be there. I mean, you guys who I'm talking to right now, we're going to be there, but the people who are watching us. Yes, yeah, you in.